God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should a friend when he's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make a way. God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make a way. Oh, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make a way. Everybody, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make it. Amen. Oh, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make a way. Oh, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make Let's all sing together now. Oh, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He... One more time. Oh, God is in control of every situation. Nothing comes against us that He does not see. So why should I fret when He's the ruler of creation? God is in control and He'll make a way. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's put our hands together and appreciate my instant choir. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to ask you to turn with me here in the book of Romans chapter, uh, for, uh, sorry, in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 15. Romans chapter 8, 
verses 14 to 15. We are reading two verses for our text. And the title of my message this evening is given as Sons by Adoption. Let's all say this together. Sons by Adoption. That means we have been made sons of God by adoption. A few years ago, I wrote a book, and that book, it is titled, uh, Signs of Sonship. I think I have two or three copies with me, but I didn't bring them here. Signs of Sonship. Father, we want to thank you for this time that you have given to us. How humbled I feel to be your mouthpiece. I am not in any way better than the men and women that are under the sound of my voice. And I ask that you give us, Father, a gathering here this evening that have hearing ears and that have seeing eyes. Lord, I also ask that you will touch my lips of clay that I'll be able to preach your word that will become meat in due season. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody say, Amen. Amen. And so, reading from Romans chapter 8, verse number uh, uh, 14 to 15, it says, uh, For as many as are led... By the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Father or Abba, Father. This sonship, my brothers and sisters, it is what makes us the heirs of God and the heirs together with Christ Jesus. I am going to quickly add another scripture that is also found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verse number 45. It says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. There is a divine reason why I brought you to this verse of Scripture. I want you to see the original intent of God uh, with creation. When He created creation, and then eventually He created Adam. God being a God of purpose, or the God of purpose, His intent was to bring many people into sonship via Adam and Eve. God did not create Adam and Eve so that they just could dress the garden and uh, farm and uh, do all that we understand was to be done in the garden. But God intended for Adam to be elevated to this position of them being federal heads where they will represent a posterity. And these will be sons and daughters that will rule and reign in the behalf of God. Remember the original purpose that God delineated and defined for man was that uh, you have dominion. You uh, govern in the garden. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. So God intended for man to exercise dominion. Now that word dominion, uh, it, it has a connotation of ruling. It has a connotation of reigning. So God intended for man to rule, to rule and reign, and then to exercise dominion. Please stay with me. I just want to move very slowly so that, and very clearly that you understand where we are going to. And so the reason why I came here in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 45. It was to show you that that first Adam was uh, a type of uh, Jesus Christ, whom the scripture 
are portrayed as the last Adam. Now, the first Adam, the Bible clearly says that he was made a living soul. And then the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So we see two Adams, and the first one, we know him as the Adam in the garden. But there was to be another Adam that would come down the road. And he is uh, uh, given by Paul as he was writing to the church at Corinth as the last Adam. Now, if there is uh, uh, the last Adam, then there is the first Adam. And uh, we know that the last Adam is Jesus Christ. And so the first Adam is the Adam that we know him who was made a living soul. Now, if you look with me here in the book of St. Luke, chapter 3, verse number 38. Now, one thing about me is that when you come uh, to where I preach, I give you a lot of scriptures. And I really am one person that does not have a lot of stories to tell. And so all I will give to you is the Word of God. And if you're a lover of God's Word, then you will love what I say and you will be my friend. And so in the book of St. Luke chapter 3, in verse number 38, it talks about the genealogies, the begets. They are so boring when you read about them in the first uh, chapters of the, of, the, of the Gospels. You read in the book of Matthew, in the first chapter, it says, so and so begat, so and so begat, and so and so begat. I call them the begets. Now, they're so boring for many of you, but they are put in Scripture for a purpose and for a reason. And so when you come to the book of Luke, we are looking at some begets. And it says here in verse number 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. And then you are bound to stop right there because you want to know who is the father of Adam. We know who was the uh, uh, father of Seth. The father of Seth was Enos. And we know who was the father of, uh, of, uh, of uh, so and so. That's given in the scriptures. But how do we get to know the father of Adam? The Bible clearly says uh, who was the son of God. That means Adam as we know him in the garden. He was the son of God. Remember the title of my message, it dwells on the subject that I've already written in my book, which is about sonship, okay? We, ha we are a people that God intends for to rise up to the level of sonship as He originally intended uh, to have with the life of Adam and Eve. Say an amen to that. And so redemption, redemption, to try to bring things back to the original plan and purpose of God. That's what redemption is all about. To redeem, to get things from straying, to get things uh, from running loose away from God and bring, bringing them back to alignment. That's what is redemption is all about. The purpose of redemption, it is to bring Things, whether it is Adam, whether it is Eve, whether it is you, to the uh, uh, Garden of Eden conditions. So God wants everything to come back to the Edenic conditions. All right? So he intends for Adam to take his place, but he's not here. Through you and through me, we must run with that mandate that God placed upon Adam. God intended for Adam to rule, to reign, to exercise dominion. But Adam is not here. That plan died a morning. There was a miscarriage, so to speak, of the purpose of God. And so God would not allow the status quo to remain. He had to moot away and come up with a way to bring things back to what he intended for things to be. And so that is what is called redemption. So redemption's purpose is to bring things back to the original intent of God with his creation. 
All right? Now, that has to happen through me and through you. There has to be a people that God is going to use. He's going to use their hands to touch other people. He's going to use their feet to go where he wants to go. He is going to use their mouths uh, to be God's mouthpieces. And so that is what God intends for you and me to become. And so that is what I call sonship. Hallelujah. Sonship. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so when you read again further in the book of uh, 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 Romans chapter 8 in verse number 19, and I quote, it is the earnest expectation of the creature. They are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. You see, that is the earnest. When you use the word earnest, it means the passionate cry, the yearning of creation. That, that's the cry of creation. And I have already put another book together. And I've given it the title, The Cry of Creation. Now, the cry of creation, it is not for a political upheaval. That's not the cry of uh, creation. The cry of creation is not for someone to rise up as a political messiah. The cry of creation is for them to see the manifestation of the sons of God. God wants you and I to rise up in, uh, in the spiritual things to a level where you can become fully recognized by God as His Son. Both male and female son. All right? Okay? We are not here uh, talking about uh, a gender disparity. No. As uh, sons of God, both male and female, when the Bible says, and God made man in his own image, it is both male and female, man, that he, not as the word man is defined by the Englishman, but as God sees his humanity. Hallelujah. And so when I'm talking about sonship, I am not excluding you, the wonderful ladies that are here, as Pastor John says, and all ladies, they are under 40. I'm not talking about you, all right? Uh, when I'm saying, I'm not excluding you, rather, but when we are saying sons, we are talking about a position that God wants to raise uh, the uh, a created being into, and that position is called sonship. All right, so the earnest expectation of the creature, creature, anything created in the garden by God, it's called creation. And so that creature is yearning. Oh, you say, what about uh, the uh, lions in the Messiah Mara? Yes, they are also waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hallelujah. You say, what about the gazelle uh, in the, the park, the national parks? In Kenya. Yes, they are also waiting for the redemption to wait. The Bible says that in the book of Romans chapter uh, 8 in verse number 21 uh, and number 21 and 22. It says, because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, let me tell you something. What do you think happened when Noah was ordering, or God himself was driving all the animal uh, life, uh, or all the animals into the ark. What do you think was happening in the ark? Where the uh, lions running after the goats. What was going on there? Uh, what, what do you think that there was blood shed there? Animal by animals? No. What, what was going on there? The, 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 the power of God was there and kept uh, the carnivorous spirit uh, from those animals that are carnivorous. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why? And, and that's the way it was in the garden. In the garden, there was no lion running after a goat or running after a gazelle. 
All creation was eating grass. All creation was eating grass. The lion was not eating meat. The dogs were not eating meat until the fall of man. When man fell, he brought about a curse. And this curse was not only affecting the man himself, but it affected all creation. And that's the reason why creation is groaning. The goat is groaning when it hears Simba the lion uh, roaring in the bush. Oh, all the goats and the gazelle, they are crying for the manifestation of the sons of God. They are saying, when the sons of God are manifested like what it was when Adam, the son of God, had not sinned, then we will not be running away from the lion. We will not be running away uh, from the leopard. We will not be running away from the cheetah. So they are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hallelujah. So we, uh, we have to uh, take our steps back to Eden. Slowly, we have to trace our footprints back to Eden. That is what we are talking about when we are teaching on the sons by adoption. We all have to come to this level of maturity in the things of God and stop playing games with the things of God. We must run, rise up to that level of sonship. You see, it is the sons of God that have the economic solutions in nations where they are placed in. You can change your government. It's not going to deliver the uh, pristine conditions as they were to be in the garden. It doesn't matter who is in power. It is the sons of God when they rise up that solutions, whether they are in the economic, it's in the economic sector, in the social sector, whatever sector it is, you and I, we better get our act together and know the word of God and rise up to that position where we become the men and the women of God in this generation. Hallelujah. We become the sons of God. And then when we rise up, to that level of sonship we become the solution hallelujah we become the solution but we are here in the backside of the desert and just doing you know church kama kawaida we are just like children playing we need to get our act together and begin to rise up with a high level of integrity as the church of Jesus Christ you see the reason is that we do not take church seriously and because we do not take church seriously nobody outside the church will take church seriously come on oh yeah hallelujah hallelujah you see, I'll give you a very typical example. And uh, please, forgive me. Have you forgiven me? No. I'll ask you to forgive me in advance. Please forgive me in advance. Love me in advance. You see, for example, when we say service starts at 3 o'clock, and we come at 5 o'clock, right? We, it shows, what does it show? In a manishan in? It just shows that we do not take that church seriously. Now, who then will take us seriously? But if you were to go for a job interview, and they tell you that job interview is at 8.30, you would do yourself a, a lot of a disservice if you got there at 8.30. In fact, you will get there at 8 o'clock and get there before that means i mean the interview is at 8 30 yeah. and you get there at eight o'clock why because you are hinging your life and your future on that 
job opportunity. But when it comes to the things of God, we are so casual and so lackadaisical to whereby the people that walk the streets there, they do not take us seriously because we do not take our calling seriously. But church here in Arizona, let's rise up to that level of sonship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may say, who are you to talk like that? I am Apostle Rutini. I know my mandate. God, one of the things God has called me to do is to bring order in the body of Christ. And so I am functioning with no apology in my office. And so we must rise up to that level of sonship. Hallelujah. Let our brothers and sisters from Kenya, amongst our Kenyan community, that we need to up the game. We want people in Arizona and in Phoenix to take us seriously. We want the mayor of uh, Phoenix to take us seriously. We want the governor of uh, Arizona to take us seriously. We want the, uh, the senator of Arizona to take us seriously. But do you know, if we want them to take us seriously, let us take our calling seriously. Come on, let's, let's do better than that. Let's do better than that. I mean, when the, when the word of God says, Adam, who was the son of God, what do you think Adam was doing? Concerning the purposes and the programs of God. And that is why when he missed the way, God came looking for him at the very spot of fellowship. What sin does, it causes you to stray away from the place of encounter. The place of encounter, that is the place of your blessing. The place of encounter, that is the place of fellowship with God. The place of encounter is a place of power. It is the place of authority. Now what sin does, it actually displaces you from your place where you meet with God. And so when God came, he says, Adam, Adam was nowhere to be found. Are you in your place when God comes looking for you to bless you? Are you in your place when God comes to lift you up? Are you in your place when God comes to elevate you to another level? And so, we must rise up to that position of sonship. Nothing short than sonship. That's what the whole world, the whole world, Kenya is looking for, the sons of God. Not a political movement. No, they are really looking for the sons of God. When they come into this church, how many of our members have really grown, matured to that level of sonship? How many of our pastors have really risen up to that position of sonship? Now, let's look at a few more scriptures. In Galatians chapter 4, in Galatians chapter 4, we're going to read from verse number one. I want to show you the process of sonship. How God makes a son out of a woman. How God makes a son out of a young boy who is just uh, playing games. You see, the Bible says, uh, Pastor Jane, in the book of Isaiah chapter six, in chapter nine, I'm sorry, in verse number six, it says unto us, a child is born and unto us a son is given. Why those two different terminologies uh, are used to describe one person? In one person, 
He is presented as a child. And the same person is also presented as a son. Now, to me, I look at uh, the two natures of Christ. The human nature as a child. And then the divine as a son. Are you with me? You see, I look at the, 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 a child just like a child. But then we need to grow up from being children into becoming sons. Sons are responsible. Sons are accountable. Sons, they have matured in the things of God. They are not playing games running around everywhere in the house of God. Sons will sit down, settle, receive the word of God, and receive uh, uh, some spiritual nourishment, and then go out and create some chaos out there, and begin to impact their spheres of influence. Am I with you? Are you with me? Let me see your hand waved at me. And so, the Bible says unto us, a child is born. Born by who? By Mary. Hallelujah. But unto us, a son is given. Given by who? By the Father in heaven. Hallelujah. And it goes on to say, it says the government of God shall be upon his shoulders. This son is coming with the government. And that government is on his shoulders. Hallelujah. Remember, what did Adam carry on his shoulders? Dominion. Yes, that's why you're in a theological seminary. Adam on his shoulders, he carried dominion. God says, I want you. The mandate is about dominion. It is about rulership. It is about authority. It is about royalty. It is about power. So he carried that on his shoulders. But he blew it. Now, the second Adam, who is coming not just as a child, but who is coming as the son of God. He has a government. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He has come with uh, an agenda. And that agenda is what we call kingdom agenda. To restore what the first Adam messed up with. What the first Adam lost. The second Adam or the last Adam is coming with the exact same government. But not to fail and flounder like the first Adam. But this time, it is the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach Himself. He is not going to fail. He will deliver. And the Bible says His name shall be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government and peace. There shall be no end upon his throne is father david upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice and it says from henceforth and the zeal of the lord of hosts shall perform it it is no longer the zeal of adam or the zeal of the child it is the zeal of the father may the zeal of god be upon you. Not just your zeal. Your zeal can peter out. Your zeal can expire. I have seen people that one time were so zealous as intercessors. But today that zeal is gone. But we now need to depend on the zeal of the Father. Glory be to God. When we had the zeal of the Father in our church some years ago, Almost about uh, 20 years ago, 21 years, God put in my heart and spoke to me uh, to put a, an ultra modern building in the city of Nairobi, of the outskirts of Nairobi. And I didn't have money. I have never wanted to beg. I'm ashamed of begging. Yeah. I started coming to the United States of America, uh, 1985. I've been preaching here 
since 1985. Coming here, going back home, coming here, going back home, coming here, going back home. But never at, one, at any one given time did I go to anybody with my hands like this. No, because I believe one thing, that the same God who is rich over here in America is the same God. What kind of a God do you serve? Huh? The God of the Americans? The God of the Africans? He's one God. The God of Abraham? The God of Isaac? The God of Asia? Jacob? The God of Rutimian? The God of Kamal? That's my Kenyan name. Kamal? The God of Karanja? The God of Odiambo? Is the same God who is rich unto them, is also rich unto me. And so we were able to put up that building, cost millions and millions of uh, shillings and even dollars. But I never bet from anyone, locally and even internationally. I don't know how to do it. Maybe some of you who know, teach me how to do it. But I don't know how to do it. <laughs> So maybe, John, the fact that I've sent you here, learn the ropes. But I don't know. And so we are debt free. We don't owe anybody nothing. We don't owe anybody nothing. But that was a miracle. God told me, go and start that building. And he told me very clearly that it will become a magnificent building. That's a, a, a King James Version Bible a word it says magnificent it says uh, it shall be miraculously built number one number two it shall be miraculously funded and it shall be called the miracle project and that's it and I went back to my church I was in Harare in a hotel when I was praying and I went back to Nairobi and I told the church that this is what God is telling me I don't know whether this resonates with any one of you, the leaders in the church, with any one of you that are in the choir, with any one of you that are under the sound of my voice. And do you know what people begin to do? Some people begin to take loans from their places of work. Not because I you know, told them to do that. Yeah. I told you I don't know how to do it. And so they begin to take loans. Some begin to sell their pieces of land. You know, like in the book of Acts, what did they do? They sold their pieces of land and what they brought the money at the feet of what? The apostles. Now, the distribution point was from the feet of the apostle. And so then we did the same thing. And uh, at that time, I didn't have a, a house. I was not driving a fancy car. Not that I drive one fancy car. But I always believed that what's the use of me driving a V8 or a V6 if there's anything like that and park it on a Mabati church. It's a mismatch. It doesn't match. Does it match? It's like you buying a very expensive car in the United States and then you park, you park it on a tin house. You're your Mabati. No, people will question your thinking. So I decided that I would do the Solomon way. What did Solomon do? He first built the temple and dedicated the temple. Decked it with all the gold and all the silver and all the copper, brass and all the precious wood from far. And when they had finished, dedicated the temple and then rested. Then God told him, now you can build the king's palace. So I did that. And when I did that, God began to open doors for me. I'm just giving you testimony. I'm not bragging. But you know when you testify, you can't help uh, but people to say that he's bragging. Don't worry about it. The Bible says, I will make my boast in God. All right, so when we did that, maybe my testimony will help someone. Then God sent someone, gave me 
uh, some money to buy a house in Lovington. It was just a bungalow, but it needed a lot of work. Now, I didn't have money to do that a lot of work. And one businessman in our church, he said, I am going to do the shell. You know, put the roof, do the window frames, the door frames, and then you take care of the matumbo. And so that's what happened. Somebody came and did that. And then we struggled by the grace of God, the help of God, to do the inside. We finished. That was after we had already built the house of God. The saints of God have a place to worship. It's debt free. I didn't beg for money. No. And so we then have a house. I'm just trying to show you that when you are faithful, you won't have to beg. When your season has come, when your season has come, and when you hang out with the right people, it's called the power of association. Hallelujah. And that's what God did for this man. Today, God has done what God only does. You see, the scripture says, they came to him, John, and they said, what will happen to us who have, we have left mothers, we have left fathers, we have left children, we have left lands, we have left houses, not for anything, not for anything. Now, it says, for the gospel's sake, what are we going to get? And then Jesus says, in the regeneration, from the Greek, it says, the Palagenesia, the again Genesis. He said, you shall have both in this land and in the one to come. Can somebody praise God with me? Praise God. And so I leave it right there. Let's go back to sonship as we conclude. Let's go back to sonship as we conclude. Glory. I hope my testimony will help someone. I believe what the scripture says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be. Can I just throw a prophetic word? Can I throw a prophetic word? We are living in a season of additions. You didn't hear that. If you heard that, you would have shouted. We are living in the season of additions. God will add to you. God will add to you. Hallelujah. If you believe that you are entering into a season of additions, give God a shout of praise. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I don't know why I had to say it, but I will say it again. In case you didn't hear it, in case you missed it, this is your season of additions. God will add to you. God will add to you these other things because you have made his kingdom a priority. Let me just read this and then I'll leave it. Thank you, Lord. In the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, uh-huh. right, as long as he's a child, a child, that means he's refusing to grow up. As long as he's a child. Here's my son here. As long as he's a child, he will get nothing. You, also, as long as you're a child, you'll get nothing. It is there, but it's not yours. So you have to be subjected to who? Tutors and governors. It says, but this child, in order for him to rise up to the position of sonship, not childship but sonship he is left to tutors and governors that's what prince william went through he had to be subjected to a life 
under tutors and governors. What do the tutors do? They instruct you. They are there for instruction. They are there to order your life a certain way. What about the governors? Governors are there to bring order in your life. They are to bring rule and authority over you. And so John, last night he says, if you do not have someone that you account to, I could never follow you across the street. He said, you have to be accountable. I have to be accountable. We all have to be accountable. We cannot just be foot loose and fancy free. We all have to be accountable. And so, when we are accountable, that means we are under tutors and governors. And tutors and governors will school us into our calling. They will school us into sonship. It says here, let me read it very quickly and, I, and I'll pray. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, he's not different in anything from a servant. Though he be Lord of all. You are Lord of all. There is dominion in you. I mean, you are hardwired to have dominion. You are hardwired to have rulership, to have royalty, to have authority. But now, because we remain children, we are living lives of servants. You remember the prodigal son when he was coming back home? What position did he ask for? He said, I'm not worthy to be called one of your sons. Let me be a servant. That is how we lower ourselves into a position of a servant. Even though God intends for you to be a Lord over all. Verse number two. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you are in one service today that is tutoring you and governing you into sonship, from a servant to sonship. Hallelujah. And so, the scripture says here very clearly, it says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent for the Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem that, that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, somebody say, because we are sons. Come on, say it like you mean it. It says, because, say, because I'm a son. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into my heart, crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Listen to me. You are not an illegitimate child. You are legally a son of God. Because of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are a legal child of God, son of God. Rise up and walk in power. Rise up and walk in sonship. Rise up and walk in glory. Rise up and rule. Rise up and reign in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You cry, Abba. You cry, Father. When you are in struggle, cry out, Father. And Abba, when you are sick, you can cry to Him and say, Abba, Father. When you are broke, you can cry to Him and say, Father, Abba. When you cannot find the way, you can cry to Him and say, Father, Abba. Give God a mighty praise. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. We have been adopted into sonship. We are sons of God by adoption. Hallelujah. Anything that is called adoption, it has to be legal. It has to be made under the law of that land. It has to be legally qualified. And so when the Bible says we are the sons of God by adoption, it means that we are legally the sons of God. And you go and tell the devil with his, and his mother-in-law that I am legally a son of God. I am the answer to the problems of the world. I am the answer to the problems of this nation. I am the answer. You are the answer to the problems of Kenya because you are the sons of God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.